now let's bring our collective understanding of the world. We have the grand glory of, of ancient Greece and ancient Rome and all that beauty being very, very, very important. But then a very significant cultural shift happens that makes the pursuit of beauty less on the agenda, as they may say. The rise of Christianity, the Roman Empire converts to Christianity, and we enter a period of art that some call the Dark Ages. And they use that term because a lot of the forward momentum that we were seeing in ancient Greece and ancient Rome actually gets backtracked. During the, the medieval period, the, the job of being an artist becomes something that certain clerics do, right? People need to decorate things, uh, the Bibles and churches and things like that. And so these people have a lot on their minds, right? They need to be religious experts. So they don't have a lot of time to devote to art anymore. And they definitely are forbidden from studying anatomy, like poking around dead people, not very holy. So they wouldn't really be doing that. And also the pursuit of beauty was something that was looked at as being very superficial, right? These, these people who have religion on their mind as their primary objective, they want to look inwards, right? The soul, the spirit, the beauty is, 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 is on the surface, right? So not very important. So unfortunately, this, this time period kind of took us back. And what it ended up doing is, you know, it, they advanced the art of, of gilding and, and mosaic and book illustration. Uh, they came up with some nifty techniques, but basically their ability to represent the, the human body or, you know, anything that they saw in a classically aesthetic way was significantly diminished. So it's almost like a period of lost knowledge that is waiting to be rediscovered. and. Then the Renaissance, the word means rebirth. Rebirth of what, one might ask. Well, now that you understand what happened, they were talking about a rebirth of the classical standards of beauty, classical understanding of beauty, classical canons of aesthetics. And they're talking about it as a rebirth because these were people who went through, you know, generations upon generations upon generations of just medieval art, you know, med or, me or medieval lack of art, more precisely. And so the Renaissance was this immense period of artistic flourishing. And it's critical to understand how this may have come about. Okay, so first things first, and this is true about all the dates that you'll see throughout this presentation. I kind of rounded it up. You know, it's not neatly started in the 1400 to 1600, right? That's too neat. So of course, you guys understand it's not exactly that clean. And some painters were kind of outside of that date range. Some some were like a little early, like Giotto, uh, and some continued a little bit later. Take the dates as a kind of broad representation of a, of a time frame. So what we're talking about in this period is a rediscovery of a lot of Greek and Roman philosophy, right? So ethics, logics, aesthetics, all these books arrive in Italy, arrive in Italy, and they cause a stir, an emotional stir. People are reading them and saying, what? This is amazing. This is crazy. And it's blowing people's minds all over the place. Now, it's important to understand how these texts arrive in Italy and why they arrive now. Well, the reason for that is the fall of the Byzantine Empire, right? The Byzantine Empire was the last stronghold of what was once a united Roman Empire, right? And, and, and the, the main city, the capital of the Byzantine Empire was Constantinople in today's Turkey, right? So pretty close to Italy. And the Byzantine Empire is making sounds like it's going to collapse and eventually does collapse. And it, it falls to the, to the Ottoman Empire. And so a lot of scholars before that time are saying, oh my God, this city's going to burn. We have to take all these important books and get out of here. So a massive exodus of scholars take all these ancient books, right, that are in the library in Constantinople, which is the last bastion of the Roman Empire, and they have all these ancient books about ancient Rome and ancient Greece. And they're escaping to the West 
and landing in Italy and are causing a stir with all this amazing intellectual canon. So this is, this is very, very influential on all the young minds of Italy. And of course, Italy back then was not like a united Italy like we know it today. It was like cities had their own jurisdiction. So we're mainly talking about the city of Florence and then later the city of Venice. But the city of Florence was incredibly influential to the beginning of the Renaissance. And a lot of these scholars really ended up here, here, there, which contributed to the rise of a new uh, philosophical movement, you could call it, called humanism. Humanism basically means on a very simple level that humans are not only important, they are powerful and with their observational capacity can figure out the world. It's not really anti-religious. It's only anti the dogmatic part of religion, which basically says, we don't know why things are going on, but it's God's will and so be it. It's a kind of rejection of that that says, no, we're going to look deeply into things. We're going to use our intellectual fa faculties. We're going to investigate. We're going to study. We're going to learn. And we can figure out the world and grow. So it's a kind of faith in the power of, of, the, human, of the human abilities and kind of putting, putting people in the center of human life, right? It's not only uh, people are kind of expendable creatures. And the only thing that matters is what you do in the next life. It's like, Things that you do right now are going to matter because making life better for humans right now is extremely significant. And we can come together as a community of humans to do it. So this is kind of something that's stirring up during the, during the time of the Renaissance. And all these texts come in, which is crazy because it's, it's teaching all these lessons to all these artists that they, they never heard before. And then add to that you know, as if this wasn't enough, right? Add to that the fact that Florence was incredibly wealthy, incredibly wealthy and getting wealthier by the day because of, you know, really successful commerce and free trade, which is causing certain families to be for the pretty much first time in history, like richer than the church, right? These are people who were so rich that they could bribe the Pope. We're talking about the most famously families like the Medici's, right? So these, these families have so much wealth and now they are, they are able to use that wealth to spend it on making themselves look rich and powerful. And how did we say people use wealth to look rich and powerful? Well, they commission works of art. So these people commission works from artists at a scale that is totally unprecedented. And they're also interested not necessarily in paintings that are only devotionals. They have secular interests because these, these are still people who are very religious, but they also have um, aesthetic concerns and they want their buildings and their, and their uh, houses and everything to look really beautiful and impressive. So they're giving artists a lot of freedom and a lot of capital and a lot of uh, intellectual stimulation to basically go wild. And go wild, they did. Okay, so important contributions of this movement, of this time period. Discovery of linear perspective, huge. Mastery of anatomy, huge. Elevation and advancement of aesthetics. What? The invention of oil painting, super critical. Rise of artist signature credits and attributions. Right, this is very important. Up until this point, you know, we look at medieval art, we say, oh man, I really like this mosaic. Who did this? Oh, we don't know. Or I really like this book illustration. Oh, who did this? Oh, it was some monk. I think it was Danish. Well, we don't know who it is, right? But in this environment of the Renaissance, it becomes very important that artists sign their work because we're finally talking about a market evolving around art. And if you sign the work Raphael, if you start to have a reputation, right? It's like, oh, I saw this painting by this Raphael guy. How am I going to commission more works for him, right? So it's a kind of early kind of business card, but it's creating a kind of celebrity culture around artists. And these artists became very, the, the successful ones, of course, became very well known in their time, very respected in their time, and very sought after by the richest members of society. So these were artists that were invited to all the coolest parties. And this is the first time that this happens in this way. And this is still true today. 
So yes, very important. And yeah, advancement of secular portraiture. So these Medici families and, and, and all the other rich folk, they were interested in getting their portraits done in very ambitious fashion, right? So unlike what was happening before where you had to kind of be Caesar to get yourself represented and immortalized, now if you had enough money, you know, you could you could definitely get a portrait. So there we 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 see for the first time portraits of people who are not great religious leaders and not great military leaders and not semi deities or emperors. We see just portraits of people who have a lot of money. So it's the first kind of uh, emergence of this of this stuff. Now, after the Renaissance, every movement is going to be followed by a series of slides of artists that you should know. So here we go. Pardon the interruption. Hope you're enjoying this video. And if you are, please take a moment to like it and to subscribe to my channel to make sure you don't miss any of my upcoming cool stuff. And if you want to support my mission of making art education affordable and accessible, please consider joining my Patreon through the link in the description below. You'll have access to live lessons, full recorded workshops, Q and A's, and much, much more. And you can sign up today for as little as $2. Thanks in advance for the support. Now back to the action. Go. So we need to know Jan van Eyck, very important, the inventor of oil painting. And also important to say that uh, the Renaissance was manifesting itself differently in what we call the Northern lands, which is, you know, Belgium among them, than in Italy. Italy, it, the Italian Renaissance was, was pretty unique. Uh, and the Northern Renaissance looked a little bit more medieval still in in its in its aesthetic conception so we have bellini in italy we have botticelli everybody loves botticelli in italy as well and leonardo da vinci heard of him heard of him no nobody uh italy uh michelangelo of course uh primarily a sculptor but earned his earned his keep as a painter as well uh rafael of course one of the greatest geniuses of uh, art history, Titian. You can also start to see again, as I said, that there's a little bit of a difference between Italy and the Northern countries. There's also a difference within Italy between the Florence, the Florentine Renaissance and the Venetian Renaissance. You can kind of start to see the difference. Oh, look at that. Oh, look at this, a little bit of a different style. So this is Venetian, Titian in, in Venice, Tintoretto also in Venice and Paolo Veronese also in Venice. Thank you.